Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Collision Vision, driven by Auto Body News. As always, I'm your host, Cole Strandberg. Today marks the second installment in our series titled The MSO Chronicles. And today's guest is the CEO of one of the most interesting and innovative operators in the industry. Michael Giarrizzo Jr. is the CEO of DCR Systems a dealer-focused body shop group with four very distinct business units and 10 locations operating at the time of this recording. Some interesting things in the works as well that we'll talk about. You've probably seen Michael online or at conferences. And in this conversation, we're going to take a deep dive into this very unique business as well as Michael's unique leadership style. Enjoy the show. Michael Giarrizzo Jr., thank you for joining us on the Collision Vision. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to a fun conversation here today. I'll, I'll dive right in, though. Tell us about your career journey and what led you to where you are today and your role as CEO of DCR Systems. Yeah, great question. I think it's a lifetime sentence. You know? <laughs> okay, <laughs> That's I'm how it goes third, in this industry. I'm, a, I'm actually a third generation collision repairer. Um, which is, uh, you know, I think getting more and more rare, uh, today. And so my grandfather started us in the automotive business in 64, uh, I think. And, um, I'm sorry, 46, what am I talking about? In 1946. And my dad took us into closing repair in the sixties. And then, uh, we built a family business after I got a, out of school from one location to four locations that got swallowed up in the first wave of consolidation. And, um, so. Back in 1999, we became, uh, I think it was the 27th, 8th, 9th, and 30th store of Sterling Auto Body Centers. And I went on to uh, take over operations after a couple of years with that company through the Allstate acquisition, which was just an incredible journey. Um, and then ultimately to realizing that, you know, the uh, things are changing and that um, we learned fundamentally a different way to do to do work and uh, launched DCR Systems in 2005 essentially and it was all about really that the vehicles would continue to get driven back uh to the dealer through through the influence of the manufacturer and certifications and specialty and technology and so uh, our model is really based around that we are an independent closure repairer um, but we do connect with uh auto dealers uh, for uh to represent them and to also obviously be sponsored uh, by them through certification for, for certification. Fantastic. And DCR Systems is a name that I've known for many years in our pre-show call. We talked about my my equipment background and you have some unique business models. Want to dive into that business. But before we do, you've you've been in the industry for a pretty long time now. You've seen a lot. What yeah, kind of in your experience where there's some key challenges you faced earlier in your career that shaped how you approach leadership and, and your approach to building DCR systems? Yeah, another great question. You know, I um, spoke in a, at an event for AXO a month or so ago, and I uh, just had realized that I just crossed into my 40th year, full-time year, because my graduation date from St. Bonaventure was, I think, May the 12th in 1984. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so it's been a few years. Um, you know, realizing, you um, uh, early on that uh, because I was not a, I, yeah, it certainly did some of the technical repairs and assisted in paint and doing a lot, you know, buffer in my hand early up, growing up, but, you know, have not done, you know, the intense structural repairs or some of the things that uh, our technicians are just do so, so well. Um, early on I had to realize that I had to blend that, um, that knowledge and my knowledge uh, uh, along with their knowledge and respect that knowledge as well and really lean on the, uh, uh, the technical expertise that we had uh, growing up uh, in the business. And then, you know, through the development of really uh, the changing workforce and this and that, really changing and looking inside myself and how I approach things and uh, making sure that people uh, I'm conscious about how they're reading me, you know, because um, I, I, I I have a tendency to be uh, very, very aggressive and, and uh, passionate about what we do. And sometimes that gets misinterpreted. So really trying to up on that as well and have people really understand our 
our why, our cause, why we do what we do, and that it's you know, it's a it's a worthy cause and and well worth uh, the challenges and everything that we face. Fantastic. And I'm taking you a, a bit of a walk down memory lane here, and this will really be my last question along that vein. But when you look back on building DCR, were there any moments or decisions or, or lucky circumstances that you look back and say, wow, that really changed the trajectory of the business and impacted where it is today? Yeah, there's so many things, Cole, you know, that uh, I could go into. But a couple of the notable things is really just the belief uh, from partnerships and uh, especially our, you know, our partnership with uh, Action Nobel, giving them a plug. It's just been supportive, uh, uh, you know, the whole way and really seeing the vision or sharing the vision you know, with them, uh, along with, you know, just the, the aha moment that, you know, we have to get more closely connected with the manufacturer, um, that the way that uh, things are done are no longer generic. And um, it, it, it's a different world today. So, because even 25, 30 years ago, the industry kind of came together through ICAR training. And um, at least, not that it was a fix all, but you had a basis to talk about and a basis that people could relate to or had been through similar type of training. Well, now you're so manufacturer specific that it's uh, it's really gone to a, um, a direction where if you don't have that sp specific training for the manufacturer, then yeah, you're getting it's getting to the point where you really don't have a whole lot of business touching that vehicle. So that that was really the you know one of the the, the big things for the trajectory of the DCR systems is really just really trusting and believing that the OEs are the ones that are going to be guiding the repair today and in the future, and uh, they they're the ones that are best to know. Uh, how they want them repaired so that the vehicle can respond the same way after an accident. And that, you know, that, that's really the whole key to this thing. And you, no longer is it about how pretty that repair is. And obviously that's part of it, the fit and finish, but it's, you know, it's peeling back the onion and understanding is this car actually reconstructed in a way that it's going to respond the same way after a, an unfortunate additional accident. Absolutely. Uh, and, and ahead of your time to kind of see that coming in, in 05 time frame is uh, is pretty cool. And it's why the name DCR has been kind of on the forefront of, of innovation from my perspective in the industry for, for um, a long time. Diving into DCR, kind of the, the meat of the conversation here. Talk to me about the business. I, I know kind of my perception and, and perspective of the business Sure. is a little bit different after having our kickoff call our, our pre-show call some unique business units just kind of walk me through the business today so yeah so uh, Cole, we you know we pride ourselves in doing things fundamentally different and uh, in a way that is driven around uh trying to deliver consistency and quality and now from the repair uh from within we have four business initiatives and they all connect around that uh, one is stores that we operate and so we're technically an independent, but like I said, we connect with auto dealers, sometimes even co-brand uh, with them, represent them through certification. We have now stores that we license. Um, and uh, that's been an eye-opening experience because now when you hand your playbook off, um, it's one thing if it's well done and well written, but can somebody else implement it? Can they grasp really what that vision is? through that playbook and be able to execute it. And how do we support that? And so that's been a really an interesting uh, endeavor. And then uh, we've uh, gotten into the calibration uh, business where we have one location now and then another one in the works and looking to do uh, several after that. And the main reason there again is around that safe and proper repair and making sure that we actually can take responsibility for that calibration and know that it's done correctly. Uh, and then, you know, one of the really um, exciting parts of our business right now that has evolved uh, from within because of this vision is Collision Clarity. And it's a piece of software application that um, essentially forces us to document everything that we do, uh, whether it be through pictures, videos, position statements, uh, uh, manufacturers work uh, instructions, uh, any uh, industry supportive documents that we're building almost a pictorial, if you will, um, of that vehicle 
the needed repairs and the validation that they were actually done correctly. So we've got you know four things going on. Uh, they all relate to uh, to each other, and it's really about the vision of the future. Where are we going uh, with this industry? And I've made you know, this analogy uh, before, but if you fast forward to 2030, which is just six years from now, uh, and you're going to purchase a 2027, whatever it might be, you know, um, that's three years old and likely had been in an accident, but it's three years in advance of technology today. You know, how do you buy that vehicle without understanding in detail its history? And vehicles that have gotten have been in an accident have a bad reputation. Well, if you if you believe even half of the industry t- statistics that are coming out today on the post repair inspections, we're, we're we're as an industry we're deserving of that reputation. We've got to change that. Um, this is about you know safe and proper repairs that ultimately are you know, create safe roads uh, to travel on. So pretty important stuff. You're a busy man. You got a lot going on. And I want to, I want to dive into each of these business units and kind of talk about the why and and the what and and dive a little bit deeper. I want to start with kind of what, what I've always thought of at least as the core business, which is your kind of dealer aligned company operated body shops. How did that concept originate? What is it? What's happening? So as I said, I'm a third generation closure repair. Part of our, our model um, early on growing up in the business was all about that dealer uh, affiliation. And so we've, we've always had those relationships. But this year, we've just formalized it and really accelerated it uh, because of the complexity around those vehicles. And with the core business unit, you're exactly right. You know, that's really it's almost like our, our R&D centers. Um, we, we, we kid about the saying, it only takes courage and cash, and we're not sure of courage. <laughs> and so, not sure on the other, but we're definitely not sure of sure courage. And so on the shop floor, we do things fundamentally different in an effort to try and make consistent the quality that we're putting into it. So a very sequential set of steps with formal quality verification between steps, you know, Admittedly, only as good as our willingness to execute that. But there are some things in, you know, uh, on our shop floor that you don't typically see uh, in the industry. And that is a completely tooled environment where we own every tool, every piece of equipment. It's all set up strategically by the people doing the work. So it's, you know, close at hand or uh, point of use, uh, if you will, uh, very formal quality verifications uh, after uh, key steps and before advancement to that next step down the process and documenting that um, well, uh, all very, very well, not only manually, but electronically. So it stays as a permanent uh, record. Um, So you got two things going on. One is, okay, where the business is coming from, where are these cars that we're going to fix coming from? And that's going to be largely to certification programs and that, you know, then creating that customer for life and that great customer experience, which is not easy today as a call it out of network, out of network repair. And we'll get to that in a minute, uh, in a minute, but also uh, on the shop floor, continuing to drive improvement. Uh, And our people are the ones that continue to move that needle where the principles of what we do don't change. But the operating model specifics are always, always evolving and improving along along the way, all in an effort to ensure a more consistent product coming out. Such a unique business model. And and it makes total sense that alignment with the dealers and, and therefore the OEs. Seems like some moving parts. Are there any challenges in that business? I think that the pros are very apparent. It yeah. seems like there's a sales effort beyond what a typical body shop would have. There seems like some moving part. Any unexpected challenges there? It's not about unexpected, but if you, I, I chuckle because if you asked our people, they would probably say, oh, my gosh, what he puts us through. <laughs> <You know? laughs> pushing, this, uh, pushing the envelope and moving the, the needle. Uh, but uh, so... A couple challenges that you have out there. One is just execution, right? Uh, because a lot of people can write a better process on paper, 
and we talk about that all the time. Our process works perfectly on paper all day long. It's our execution that makes the difference, right? So it's it's really, really important that we continue to remind ourselves over and over and over again. Um, we compensate different than most, not than all, uh, but than most. And through the last you know, several years where uh, our industry's capacity shrunk and demand was through the roof and you know, shops were booked out, you know, six, eight, 12 weeks or so. And the flat rate, you know, um, ideal compensation kind of uh, became the ideal compensation for sure for a couple of years. That's a challenge as well. Um, uh, you know, growing our own people uh, inside of our organization, uh, something that's very, very important to us. But also then, you know, the, I, I believe in this is now going to come together in the in the in the coming years, but early on and and even now, um, you know, being a certified repairer, conflicted in a lot of cases with being inside of a network or of, you know, when I say network, I'm going to talk about DRP being being inside of an in net or being an in network shop as we call it versus what we are as an out of network shop, right? Uh, we want to be insurance friendly by process, but we're not part of uh, many uh, programs at all, if any, in most locations, uh, simply because some of the requirements of the manufacturer conflicted with um, with some of those programs. And again, I think that that comes together, but that's that's still a challenge today. So I think it comes together in the future, but it's still a challenge today. It's a challenge for our people. You're know, preparing the customer without scaring the, the the customer, and then working them out a reasonable settlement without compromising the work that we're going to do and so that that's a challenge and you know i i kid about this but sometimes i cry about it it's not the greenest path so we don't suggest everybody run out and try this at home uh it's not because um you know you you have to balance especially trying to replicate that uh, you have to balance between that customer experience and that concession that you're going to make and it is just a pure concession on the shop standpoint. It really digs deeply into our prof profitability and our ability to reinvest in the company. So it's a balancing, it's a balancing act uh, uh, today. And you know the carriers have removed layers of oversight and layers of uh, of folks, so they're strapped with not a, a lot of people and put a lot less oversight now. I think on the in network than out of network. So it's kind of it's kind of strange and it's one thing that if you're you know in a niche market and you're certified by a couple manufacturers and it's a single location or maybe it's a small two-store mso and you're there every day working it with the customers you know that's one approach when you're trying to replicate that over a number of stores and then help to coach people with the right word tracking and you know trying to create a customer experience when you know there will be challenges on the settlement side um you know that's that's right that's what we're right in the middle of uh right now and and we're really hopeful uh that collision clarity that software application really helps change the game uh you know in, in the future where it becomes a method of settlement because it's so easy to put oversight uh through that model and you could really, with that oversight, you could develop OE expertise to actually be part of that oversight versus, you know, today, and we can go on and on, but today, I, I'm not going to sit here and defend the carriers, but I understand their dilemma, right? <laughs> They're seeing the widest variety of capabilities of body shops that have ever been, right, in existence. Yeah. Again, growing up the business in the business, it was really the materials that you used. It was the craftsmen that you could attract and they were known around the markets and who had the best tech. It was all about that. It was all about, you know, the shape of that fender. And today, today we're in a different ball game. So you can imagine from a carrier standpoint, they're going out and they're seeing all kinds of different stuff. So they don't even know what they owe, you know, and, and, and consequently, I think they just kind of revert to, okay, let me just go to the lowest denominator and, and start there. And so it, it's challenging. That's part of our model that is uh, 
the super challenging that we work at every uh, single day, not only for our customers, but for our people, because, you know, it can be very, very, very stressful. Sure. You know, especially when the, you know, the, you know, I believe that the vast majority, if not all of our people share the vision, you know, we, we do so much with uh, helping them to understand where the industry is coming from today that they're believers. You know, we yep. took our entire leadership team to Palm Springs uh, in January to CIC and to the SCRS open board meeting. It was phenomenal. I think we had 24 people there. Wow. But it was one of the most powerful leadership conferences we do one a year that we've ever had because they got to feel and experience what, you know, People like myself, they get out to a lot of industry events. My partner, Cheryl Boswell, and some of our other people, they get out to these industry events. You're hearing this over and over again, and you're bringing it home. But after a while, your people are like, oh, you know, okay, are they a little <laughs> overboard? <laughs> and so getting them to actually experience that, again, help to reinforce, you know, why, um, you know, our vision, our why, our cause is so, so important. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, love love getting folks out and about and, and getting to experience what, to your sure. point, you and me and and a great shout out there to another Collision Vision guest and, and Cheryl Boswood, uh, Boswell, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so very, very cool. That's awesome. From a, I don't know of another business with exactly your model. I think it's very unique, but I do know a lot of body shops are aware of the importance of, of dealer relationships and going out and, and getting those. What advice would you have for shop owners looking to establish or enhance their partnerships with car dealers. Yeah. So what you have to realize is that that referral is a huge risk to an auto dealer. Um, we're representing them. Uh, that customer uh, is going to uh, perceive that the dealer's part of that experience. And so we're representing them. So giving that dealer the assurance that we're going to represent them well, that, you know, any issues will be uh, taken care of, uh, that they're going to be the beneficiary of that experience because the experience is going to be a good one with the customer and for a safe and proper uh, repair. Um, you know, the use of OE parts were an all OE uh, uh, closure repair. Uh, certainly they like that. Um, you know, the, we do a lot of unique things to interact with the dealer, certainly on the sales side, you know, we're, we're, what, what are we, one out of five and a half vehicles coming into the body shop are probably not going to be repaired. You know, those customers, a lot of them will have a check and need a ride home. So we might as well help our, our dealer partner that way as well. So it's kind of a, a what's in it for them as well, uh, uh, along with mitigating, uh, that risk, but we've got to set our sights on representing them. Uh, really well through certification makes total sense and and again it's something that i think you were ahead of your time in the importance of those oe and dealer relationships and it's it's getting to be a much more popular topic now and i think that's a really good step in the right direction from an industry perspective a couple of things you've said throughout our conversation so far and and what i know about you tells me that that you're a pretty anal analytical person and operate the business from that perspective. Are there any metrics or feedback mechanisms that you use to monitor and improve your shops? And then kind of what we'll get to a little bit later on with your licensee locations. Yeah, so um, again, great question. And we're constantly looking for better and better metrics. And we, we have metrics around really how is the customer feeling? How are, how are our people feeling and that's really really important to us um and so you know you, you not only have the, the csi but we're going to do uh, a lot of uh people interaction a lot of get get our people very comfortable feeling safe in the environment to be able to express when there's a, an issue or a concern or something they might may feel is, uh, is not working but it's really just having the your you you know thumb on the finger on the pulse of the, of the business and your people really getting to read them. So it's really tough from a, a pure metric standpoint. Uh, from a production standpoint, we use very unique and different metrics, which are all going to be leading indicators. Um, we, we believe in that type of a, a thought process so that it gives us the opportunity to fix something before it um, 
before it affects the customer. Lagging indicators such as financial statements and things like that, even CSI to some degree, uh, should be reinforcing what we already know if we're of that mentality that we're going to focus on leading indicators uh, of the business and things that are out front that indicate really the results that are to come. Um, we'll also, you know, with our dealer relations, look at, you know, how many new car leads uh, went to that dealer and how many did they close on? Um, you know, what, how is our service in, interaction going and how many service leads uh, went their way, whether they're closure repair related or not, you know, because that customer coming in to the collision center may need maintenance or have a, um, uh, you know, uh, a recall uh, uh, waiting to be done, something like that, where we can make it more convenient uh, for the customer. So uh, we don't have really the the traditional metrics that you see coming out of our, our industry. Uh, those are more lead, you know, on that leading edge, looking for uh, ways that we can actually, you know, fix something before it impacts the customer. So without giving any super secret sauce away, can you give us any examples of some of those leading indicators or how other operators might view that whole concept? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, in pure DCR fashion, we've moved away from a lot of industry terms and stuff like right. that. So hours are not part of our vocabulary anymore. Uh, units are. And we classify a unit as a hundred bucks of labor. So it doesn't matter what type of labor, if it's a body labor, paint labor, mechanical labor, it doesn't matter what market it, it is in. It gets translated into a unit, which is a hundred bucks of labor. And what it allowed us to do is really create uh, a, a much more level playing field amongst our stores and an understanding, right? Um, we're looking at the business from three um, indicator standpoints. That one is output, and output is measured in six different collection points through the system. So, and it doesn't really matter what percentage, and sometimes our people have gotten hung up, oh, you know, this assembly should have more of a percentage. And it really doesn't matter just so that they're consistent. So it's measuring how fast it's actually in the six collection points. It's pulling part of the total units off of the job as it's advancing through steps of the process. We also then have units to ready. Ready being uh, our um, definition of ready is a car that is essentially kitted for completion. So complete repair plan, audited repair plan. Uh, we've got approval. We have parts that have been received and verified for correctness. Um, we have uh, structural or any uh, intense mechanic work is completed. So this car is essentially ready for the finish line, which involves body repairs, prep, paint, reassembly, uh, detail. So how many units have gone to ready? Uh, on that given day. And then the first indicator is input. So we're looking at the, the store's inventory and saying, okay, they're all important, but there's only one priority. You know, if we've got this ready inventory, we're, we've got, you know, 10 cars that are all essentially, as I mentioned, kitted for completion, right? They're sitting in that ready inventory waiting on our watch, right? So our priority becomes output, right? How do we put more people in that production line to make it go faster. If the system's starving, we have to look at are there cars backed up waiting for parts, backed up waiting for our build down stage, which includes that structural and, and mechanical most of the time, or is it simply we need more cars in the door, right? And we need the right cars uh, more aggressively. So we're trying to balance that out on a daily basis to simulate a continuous even flow. It works. Per it works perfect every time. No, of kidding. course, <laughs> man. Yeah. So you're so right. So much of that terminology is is very far from traditional collision repair terminology, much more in the vein of, of manufacturing and production line type terminology. And there's a couple other pieces kind of within that realm. I want to I want to chat briefly about uh, and they're, they're somewhat related, but kind of talk to me briefly about the lean production principles and, and that impact on the body shop world and sort of within that that same realm talk to me about that just in time delivery yeah so um it's funny because obviously lean production has become a buzz over the last uh 20 years and i think 
a lot of it started out of the Sterling days, and there's been a huge Sterling influence, uh, given Sterling credit where credit is, is due across the industry in so many different areas. But people misinterpret really what that is about. And when somebody says, oh, that doesn't work, doesn't work, it just means that they simply don't understand because the lean principles do in fact work. It's our ability to execute them that make the difference. And you know, people ask, okay, where to start? Well, it's pretty simple. And my early lean journey, which started in basically 2000 or 99, uh, even though as a family business, we inherently did things that would fall under lean principles. We had no idea. Uh, but my lean journey uh, started uh, in back in Westchester, Pennsylvania, as a regional manager uh, for Sterling. And we got locked in a room for about a week. I like to say, A, way too many Philly cheesesteaks uh, <laughs> that week. But um, uh, we had myself and seven or eight other regional directors, along with, at that time, uh, the COO of Sterling prior to my taking that role. And after a week in you know measuring time and distance traveled and and uh, really identifying and creating a value stream uh, map for the entire process and future state and all that stuff, we came away with really a very, very simple but not easy concept that if we got it right up front, <laughs> in other words, we diagnosed that vehicle 100 percent correctly up front and we identified exactly the parts that were needed and we were able to convey that correctly to the part sources which in our case you know our dealers that the whole thing went pretty easy but it was when there were misses and the rework that we call supplements and all that stuff was going on it re it became pretty uh pretty chaotic so you know for those that you know, you know ask me hey how do i get started it's it's actually a, a pretty fun exercise. Just take your team, buy them a piece of lunch or whatever uh, you you want to, and get a whiteboard up there and say, okay, what would have to happen up front as we were diagnosing that vehicle to make sure that we only needed to diagnose one time? And so you start to move away from teardown and you move more towards a strategic disassembly where you're touching and feeling every part. Uh, um, inventorying it, identifying, does it need to be replaced? Is it one time use? All that kind, kind of uh, thing. You're going through it really in a step by step process uh, with the right skills at the right time, in the right place to identify every bit of damage. At the same time, you're measuring the vehicle uh, up front so that we could actually have specifically a structural plan if that's necessary. You're doing a uh, color verification up front. So if you if you go after it with the mentality, hey, we only have one time to do this, your team and virtually any body shop team, if you will, around the country, uh, if we if we push them creatively enough, we come up with a very, very similar list. Right. And now it's a matter of, OK, how do we execute that? Right. How do we take that and put that to our model? So that list becomes very, very similar. of All the things that we need to do to get it right up front one time because you have to assume if we're repairing cars that ultimately we do discover all of this stuff right so this is just about discovering it at the right time in the right place which is up front so you, you know we call it pre-op right and for for good reason throwing some medical terminology in here yeah. here now yeah so you <laughs> want to hope that if you're going into for any significant surgery that they've done all their homework up front and, you know, again, kidding, but it's not that funny, but you get in for a heart transplant and they open up the cooler and they go, oh, no, shoot, we got a liver. Yeah, <laughs> they got a problem. So, <laughs> you know, and it happens every day. And, you know, I, I would love to say that our stories are execute uh, to uh, perfection, but we're often reminded when we don't execute well. Uh, sure. that's where, where we are reminded virtually every single time. Love it. Ah, great stuff. Really enjoy talking about kind of that, that core piece of the business, but I want to spend some time in the rest of it as well. Some big things happening. Talk to me about the licensee model. You have a few locations out there. Describe kind of how this model works and, and what inspired you to grow in that direction. Yeah. So um, part of what inspired us was just growing the DCR network and our cause. Uh, it was also what inspired us is 
you know, do we have truly a complete turnkey package that somebody else can embrace and actually uh, find value in? And we've learned uh, so much in the last two years. There's only been a couple couple of years uh, of the things that we do well and that we have documented well and the things that we needed to improve. Um, we look for those uh, stores that are out there that that have the DCR license to uh, significantly improve in their overall performance. It's a, not an easy change uh, for them. It's a fundamental change for them. And some of these stores were very traditionally run uh, stores. So, you know, it was a big risk on their part and certainly a big risk from us, uh, from our, our part. And we've had some great uh, success stories. We've had some challenges along the way. We've learned how to support the model better and better. Um, you know, the pandemic threw us into this virtual world, which allowed us to develop more, you know, online training, uh, lunch and learn Zooms, uh, that that type of thing, interaction in so many different ways that maybe we wouldn't have thought of uh, prior to that. So um, we're really uh, excited, especially there's a couple of stores that really just kill it. Um, and we have a couple of stores and, you know, one in particular that, a lot, a lot of it stems around leadership and the management and their belief in a fundamentally better way and getting them on board uh, as well. And we've learned that uh, also. You know, the model can be super tight on paper, but it takes leadership to really believe um, and willingness to to convey that to a team that they're going to execute and why that's so important and, and the value of what what is delivered, which. You know, ultimately what we want is that safe and proper repair consistently day in and day out. That's what, that's what we're after. Absolutely. Who from your perspective is that pers uh, perfect licensee? Is it an existing body shop? Is it an entrepreneur looking to break in? What's right down the middle for you? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a bit of, of both, you know, what we're finding success and we have uh, one um, uh, organization in Western New York that actually has a, what we call an area development uh, agreement. So it's a big license agreement over several hundred uh, mile radius. And we love that because now we've got a great operator at the core that wants to grow the business that believes in a better way of doing that. that, that that's a great, uh, a great one. Um, you know, we have also, uh, you know, dealer shops uh, in the network that were just not performing. And um, they were concerned uh, around that that performance that led them to us. Um, I still maintain one of the greatest concerns that is often overlooked is the liability. And we're starting to hear liability buzzword more and more and yes, more. Yes, we are. Um, you know, so it's only a matter of time until, uh, unfortunately, it's unsafe uh, repairs uh, start to really impact the road or the awareness comes out because they're impacting uh, they're, they're impacting the road today and the safety, you know, uh, the general uh, safety of people today. Uh, so it's um, it's so, so, so important to understand that, that our model is designed to help mitigate that risk also uh, as well. And, um, you know, when it all works together, it's a pretty special model, but it takes a lot. It does. It takes a lot. And it takes the first and foremost, we're realizing a different mindset by leadership that is willing to say, hey, we're we're making change. It makes sense. It's going to be up to us to execute it and only up, uh, up to us uh, to see it through, because fundamentally, it makes a lot of sense. It's very it's a goal. It's actually pretty an embarrassingly simple model. It is. It just doesn't mean it. Sim simple doesn't mean easy. Because easy yes. takes change and takes disciplined execution. Yeah. Yeah. Breaking the mold of what I think a lot of people view view the business as. And it's tough, I would imagine, to completely rethink how you've thought about an industry for a long time. Sometimes to a fault, I think. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Very cool. Um, and when did you roll out that licensee model? Uh, I think it was three years ago. Beautiful. Maybe, maybe just... Maybe, maybe a little bit more than that, just prior to the pandemic. Okay, um, fantastic. And yeah, how many so licensee locations today? There's four. There's four. So six stores that we operate, uh, four that we license. So 10 locations total, 
total in our network. All right. All right. Plus a great segue into one of my favorite topics here of late on the collision vision, ADOS calibration. You've broken into the ADOS calibration center game. What led to that decision? How has that experience been thus far? So what led to it was really getting a better and better understanding of uh, the importance of it and the environment that actually was required to do a, a proper calibration and realizing that what we were doing currently, you know, um, probably wasn't delivering a lot of confidence uh, along that way, you know. So uh, we were using a lot of the traditional outside sources, whether it be mobile uh, folks, you know, our dealer partners, that type of thing, and real and getting more and more education um, and learning more and more about what was required. Uh, we decided, you know what, we, we need to really uh, rethink this and do this ourselves. And um, so we uh, we headed down that road. We uh, we are partnered with Car 8S Solutions, which they've been fantastic in support. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a believer you let people do what they do best. And we're we were getting into kind of a new frontier and and versus, you know, uh, having having support there to help us along the way versus reinventing the wheel uh, was super, super important uh, to us. Uh, we do. Um, uh, do in-house calibrations at more of our um, i call our niche stores we have a couple of stores that really focus around one or two manufacturers um and um so that you can dial into and dive into specifically what that manufacturers requires and it's base provided create that environment that that makes sense um at our big location where we started the first calibration uh, center we're supporting 15 or 16 different manufacturers uh, so that had to be a much more diverse and capable center. And um, that um, uh, really uh, over the last six months have, has really accelerated to the point where now we're starting to build open capacity and starting to take in outside uh, work. The second location will be uh, completely standalone. Um, it'll be somewhat near our uh, uh, west side of Brook Park location. Uh, so we'll certainly we'll get that business, but there's a lot of body shops on the west side of town that really need a uh, a confident calibration. And it's not only doing it right, but it's also documenting it correctly. And I think that's where we're lock, you know, we lacked before, where we were getting back that invoice you know, from whatever the source was, and it said calibration, you know, X number of hundreds of dollars. And he went, well, I hope so, right? Uh, uh, but... Uh, um, I always talk about, and I kid about this. We have one of our, our partners that uh, actually calibrate in the church parking lot, so that has to have something going for it, right? So, <laughs> no, uh, uh, you know, I kid, I'm kidding aside. It's an important part, you know. Um, uh, it, it really is, and you you think about it. And uh, it was, I was at an event at the SEMA Garage, I don't know, maybe a year ago with SCRS where. They were doing some testing of uh, Silverado and just a three inch lip kit and the impact uh, to the advanced driving assist systems. And we're mm -hmm. long and short of it. And there are a number of different uh, things that came off of that, that study, but just with a three inch lift kit, um, the approaching vehicle or approaching the vehicle where it was supposed to come into view at 60 feet came in at 48. You know. It's a big difference. Yeah. What's the impact? <laughs> I'm not sure, but I don't want to find out. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it's a good thing. That's right. for it sure. Doesn't, right. It doesn't sound like it's a good thing. And how that, and there were some statistics that uh, how that actually impacted its ability to stop and that 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 type of thing. So it's it's important uh, uh, today. And, and, and again, you you just fast forward to another five or six years down the road in technology where these cars are more and more connected on the roads. Um, it becomes even more important. I think statistically, we're still in the 20s uh, as far as 25 or 28 percent cars on the road with advanced driving assist systems, um, and that's expected to, you know, roughly two and a half or uh, or three times the amount triple over the next five or six years. And um, if we've got cars that were repaired and they're on the road and not calibrated correctly, then we, we probably have a pretty big mess. No, no, no doubt. We talk about safety 
that's as important as anything we're talking about from a safety perspective. And, and shout out to another guest on the Collision Vision in, in Greg Peters of Car ADOS Solutions. Uh, dive very deep into the ADOS calibration world and, and the importance of those, those centers that you're opening up. So congratulations on that. Uh, one mm -hmm. location, two underway. When was the first one opened? Uh, a year and a half ago. Beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. Year and a half. Well, an, another great avenue for growth for sure. And want to talk about kind of that last of the business units and business focuses you talked about in your in-house software development. Uh, what an undertaking, I imagine. But but talk to me about what you guys have built, what you have going on, and what it does for you. Yeah. So um, yeah, thank you. It um, it really is a special. Uh, application and the fact that it was built in house and was built by uh former technicians um these are guys that, and they're still very very young guys but uh they were uh, master level technicians in both uh structural body and paint they've run stores for us they've become uh, master level repair planners and when we you know put out the challenge um that we had and what we were trying to produce even to our our um body shop management software company and that was it was kind of wasn't well received uh maybe they didn't truly understand what we we're trying to accomplish we had these guys who had, we had no idea uh, coded on the weekends as a pastime and says i think we could create the solution uh we certainly understand the challenge that we're trying to resolve and so we started the started this in-house uh, three and a half uh, years ago and um, it developed from there where we gave a uh, couple of guys a couple of months to frame it out. And within six months, we were actually using the application. Uh, and uh, we use the application now on every vehicle that we repair. So there's an electronic folder, if you will, for every vehicle we repair with uh, not only how it was diagnosed, but then what was actually uh, performed as far as as far as the repair process essentially what it does it takes the line items of the repair plan the estimating platform it doesn't matter which one it is and it lines up the evidence with those lines so it makes it very easy as you scroll through that repair plan um, for the evidence to pop up if you will which could be a photo it could be a video it could be as i mentioned before position statements manufacturers work instructions uh, industry um, documentation, all that stuff is in there. You can actually create fail safes, enforced documentation uh, in areas, and it really is a, a tool that drives value to all stakeholders in the industry, which is why it's so near and dear uh, to us, to me, uh, and we're so passionate about that uh, because it levels the playing field. You know, it doesn't have a language barrier, and it doesn't really care how you compensate people. It's forcing us as an industry to be transparent. And so it's called collision clar clarity, building trust through transparency. You know, we believe that someday uh, this could be a valuable method of settlement because carriers have to change as well. They realize that, you know, that they can't keep up with the education required around all these systems specifically to each manufacturer. It's virtually uh, impossible. You know, the customer, why should the customer have a vehicle tagged um, on Carfax, if you will, with an accident and have it lose huge amounts of value, even though it's going to lose some value just because it was in an accident. If you have some, some level of documentation to say, yeah, but it was done by a certified repairer, take this electronic folder to your local professional and, and see what they think. And they look at it and say, okay, it was repaired uh, with uh, original parts and Maybe there's structural uh, measurements or, or, or documentation there. There's you know, proof of proper calibrations and all the all of the detail around that repair to say, hmm, okay, uh, I'm, I'm okay with this. You know, versus you know what we're seeing today. If, if you believe even a part of the CIC study that was done and uh, uh, and presented a couple of meetings ago, and now I understand there's going to be another one. Uh, where they're going to quadruple the size of the sample size. But I think out of 26 cars that were post-repair inspected, 23 of them were deemed economic total losses because the cost of re-repair properly exceeded value. Well, man, that's that's something that as an industry, we can't 
continue with. Um, you know, it's it's different. You know, I, I, I've said this a number of times over the last few months that I'll date myself because I clearly remember when a bad repair was just ugly. Right? The quarter <laughs> panel was wavy and the color match was no good, whatever it was, you know, but nobody got hurt. And today, um, although we don't do post repairs inspections formally, we will offer them a post repair safety inspection as a certified closure repair, especially when the customer gets persuaded, intimidated, or whatever to go elsewhere to an in-network shop. And we're seeing some actual pretty repairs, I call them, good color matches, even fit and finish, it's not so bad. But when you pull, peel back that onion, we got compromised welds, we got lack of corrosion protection, we got blind spot monitors not working, we have all the stuff going on that actually now creates a very pretty but unsafe vehicle. And um, I think in the ones that we've done, we're a hundred percent failure rate, unfortunately. Mm. So clarity is really designed to change the industry, change the world, you know, um, that we're going to have to become a transparent world uh, in the future. It's just impossible for me to believe that we're not going to have to, that we're not going to have to have documentation that details out the history of the vehicle. Uh, even, you know, yet I hate to say this, I mean, I get I cringe saying this, but at what point do carriers start looking into the history? And did it contribute to that accident? Did it contribute to an injury? You know, like without the giant eagle case was going to change the world or whatever what was that now eight nine years ago something like that yeah. um and it didn't at that point but it's coming i don't want to scare anyone but documentation is key today it's absolutely key today you know i hear more and more and more and more events that i go to liability 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 and um you know we have to first and foremost have the intention to put a safe and proper repair back on the road and then protect the business along the way. Man makes total sense. And, and I think you're preaching to the choir. A lot of our listeners here are really focused on ensuring not only proper repairs, but to your point, documentation, that's going to be key. And I think uh, to build that tool in house and for your licensees, uh, quite the investment, quite the undertaking, but seems like well worth well worth all of that effort. And it's a great segue because I want to zoom out a little bit. Uh, there's been so much change in this industry. I, th I think you and I would both agree there's a lot more coming down the road here pretty soon. What are some of the major trends you're observing in the collision repair industry that you think we'll, we'll kind of see the impacts of? I know you mentioned a big one there, and that's the discussion of liability. Sure. Anything else maybe a little more positive too? <laughs> yeah, well, so just to, just to go back with the collision clarity, um, the, the positive that comes out of that is that we're going to be able to offer that to the industry here in the next three to four months. Uh, we've actually now contracted another firm to help optimize the user experience, and they're super excited about it. Um, we picked the, we really um, vetted out and picked the, the right folks to help us with that. So the, that's a positive. Uh, and uh, we believe that the industry will receive it well because it really takes into account everything that's important. Uh, the trends that I'm seeing in, and uh, the location I'm at right now is, the, is one of the most challenging because we represent a semi-large uh, auto group with I think 21 or 22 rooftops in 17 or 18 different manufacturers. Very, very, very challenging to keep up with all the training that's manufacturer specific, ICAR training, uh, um, you know, industry partner training, all the stuff that's going on, very, very tough to keep up. So what we see going on and we see it even in the performance our stores is um, that niche. And what I mean by niche is really where, where does your expertise lie? Really where are you hanging your head on and becoming that expert, whether it be in, you know, two or three or four different manufacturers, which I think that's going to be more the trend in the future, which could be difficult beyond that. And maybe those manufacturers are kind of clustered together and similar, whether it be German brands or, or domestic brands or whatever, whatever it might be. But we're seeing that more as a trend uh, that, that makes sense. These cars are complex. So, 
you know, creating expertise in those manufacturers specifically really ease the burden on our people. Like I said, at this location here, there's so many manufacturers represented that we are constantly looking for ways to kind of dial that in where that it doesn't overburden our people, that there's only certain manufacturers that certain people uh, have to uh, be concerned about and how do we segment our workflow so that we are, you know, becoming more manufacturer centric in uh, the certain lines, uh, as you will, or the cells that are on this, this campus. But the main thing is that, you know, know your niche, become that expert, figure out how to market to that. That's, that's where we're going. It, you know, I don't, I, I believe in the future, because I, I believe the time is now, but I believe that in the future, more and more that your vehicle will go back to a manuscript manufacturer specific certified facility for anything of any significance. It's almost even beyond, it's almost right down to the cosmetics because, you know, just a scratch in the door and taking the door apart, you better know what you're doing by that manufacturer just in taking it apart uh, first along, versus, you know, even the repair uh, process uh, along with it. So niche, uh, learning, learning how to uh, address tomorrow's workforce, uh, super important and then obviously that that documentation piece some good trends that we've hit all over and, and really appreciate that michael you've been so generous with your time i want to start wrapping up we still got a couple things to address but as you know we like to end each episode of the collision vision with three key takeaways from this conversation today i think it's going to be tough to extrapolate only three but what would those takeaways be in your mind the takeaways would be, okay, what is my, you know, what, what's the purpose of my business, right? You know, what is our niche? Uh, do we have a niche? Can we create one? Uh, can we further advance our niche? Uh, number one. Number two is uh, how do we attract and train uh, the future? Uh, is it by changing the way work is done? You know, growing up in the business, you, it took you 15, 20 years of experience. We don't have that much time today. So how do we break down our process to make it more inviting uh, for tomorrow's workforce? And then documentation, documentation, uh, documentation. Really verifying that we are following manufacturers' work instructions and that we're willing to document not only what was supposed to be done, but what was, what was actually performed. And um, uh, so, so really, I think, those are three things that really uh, will kind of dictate that future uh, for closure repair businesses. And um, you know, do we have a path on all three of those to make us really sustainable in the future? Great stuff. Where can people follow along with you and learn more about DCR systems? So certainly our website um, is, a, is a great way. We do a lot on social media. Uh, as well, or people love that. So you'll see us on Facebook a lot, and even some on LinkedIn and some on Instagram. But you know, we're not a, we're not afraid to show you know what we're doing or, or share what we're what we're doing uh, with the rest of uh, the industry and the world, for, for that matter. So um, you can you can catch us really on, on both. Our website has a really good explanation of, of our business models and why we do what 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 we do. But Google up DCR systems, you'll come up with all kind of fun stuff that to check out. Fantastic. We'll go ahead and throw some links in the show notes as well to make that super easy for folks. I have a feeling they're going to want to check it, check it out. Michael Giarizzo Jr. Thank you so much for a great conversation. Had a blast. Thought it was uh, really productive and, and ins insightful. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you as well. We can go on for days, right? Oh, I would love to. I know. <laughs> I know. Thanks so much, Michael. Take care. Thank you to Michael Giarizzo Jr. for joining us today for a great conversation. Michael's success speaks for itself, and the business he's built is super interesting to me, and I hope this conversation was super interesting to you as well. I wanted to reiterate Michael's three key takeaways. They spoke to me, and those were, number one, know your purpose and know your niche. He kept mentioning that niche word, as have a lot of really good guests here on the Collision Vision. I suggest you take note. If you don't have a niche, create one. If you do, Find out how to advance and build around that. Number two, 
Change the way work is done to attract your future. Michael's very systems oriented. He suggests breaking down your process to help expedite the training and knowledge for tomorrow's workforce. We don't have a bunch of years to develop these people. Let's try to expedite that. Lastly, documentation, documentation, documentation. As a close mentor of mine says, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And to Michael's point, doing good work is the most important thing to do in our industry. Proving you did good work is becoming more and more important every day. That is all for today's very special episode in the MSO Chronicles series of The Collision Vision. Be sure to hit that follow button and share this episode with your network, as well as any others you find to be interesting. Also, if you feel like watching the action in addition to listening to it, be sure to check us out on YouTube, where The Collision Vision lives in video form. As always, on behalf of the Auto Body News team and myself, thank you for coming along for the ride. Mm -hmm.